everybody. Welcome back. It is another episode of DadCast. Of course, I am JP, as always, joining us, Mr. Nick Martin. How are you, Nick? All right, man. How are you? I'm fantastic, as you can see, um, and, and it plays along with the theme of today's show, kind of, sort of. I traveled to Montana, where I am literally doing this podcast at the Yellowstone Ranch. Uh, so there you <laughs> have it. I'm saying the brand right behind there you. There it is. Today on the show, man, um, he is making his second appearance on DadCast podcast. Um, he's a legend in his own right. Um, I think I mentioned this last time on uh, the previous episode, but he's appeared in every single TV show that has ever existed in the history of television. And just some of those examples, most recently, Yellowstone, 911 Lone Star, Better Call Saul. He is on, uh, I'll come Nick, help me, help me, Tulsa. Tulsa King, which is right yes. now out on Paramount Plus with yeah. Sylvester Stallone, Anger Management, Dallas, Celebrity Poker Showdown. I hope I could literally spend an hour going down this list of casts. One of my favorite movies of all time you start in was War Games. Please welcome to the show, Mr. Barry Corbin. How are you, sir? I'm doing very well. Thank you. Good, 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 man. So at the rite of passage, of course, and and you have the distinction, I believe, Nick, of being the most experienced father on yeah, this yeah. show. With that being said, though, we got to ask the question, are you a dad good, sir? Me? Yes. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So being the most experienced yeah. dad here on this panel, how many children, how many grandchildren? And uh, we'll start from there. Me? Okay. Four, four children. Uh, let's see. Uh, six, seven, eight, nine. <laughs> uh, nine grandchildren. Uh, uh, three, four, five great grandchildren that is a litter man congratulations on that are you are you able to I'm keep up with any of them be... these days oh yeah keep up with uh with most of them <laughs> somewhat nick they it's a... fast for me they, they they're a little I, you know i've slowed a little down uh in my past two or three years so i can't keep up quite with them as uh, much as i used to Gotcha. And Nick, yeah. are you taking notes here? Cause yeah, yeah. Well, I'm pretty sure he is the only great grandpa we've actually had on the podcast. I don't think we've had anybody this experienced ever. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing, man. Congratulations on that. So as we discussed, the y'all need to get more old people on there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm, with, I'm in. I'll sign. I, I love hearing the stories in the history. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I, I choose the word experienced, Barry, not old people. But if you want to go that route, yes. Uh, well, you can you can do either one. They love it. They appreciate it better if you call them experience. <laughs> That's what uh, I was going for. So Nick, uh, he, he's trying to keep up with you here. He's about to have his seventh kid here in just a month, month or two. Yeah, yeah a month, about six weeks. Seven kids in a month. No, no. <laughs> number seven. Number I'm, seven I'm not, I'm will not be appearing. Be Nick Cannon here. Come on. <laughs> but, what are you? Are you the Emir of Kuwait? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I oh, probably dude. should have reworded that, huh, Nick? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. He's expecting his seventh child in the next coming months. There. That, that, that's, yeah, that's how I should have worded it. Thanks. <laughs> what, what ages are they? What ages um, do they go So from? my kids age from two years old all the way up to 20, ooh, 23, I think he is. 20, he's either 22 or 23. It's, it's hard to remember once you get more than two of them. <laughs> yeah. Well, mine, mine go from, from, uh, from 57 to 40. Okay. 57 so, uh, to 40, man. That's just, yeah. I can't even, I can't wait to get to that. Get to, I hope I make it like, to that point I, because I mine are only dad cast when we have nine, 57 year old kids. Yeah. Cool. And, and, and uh, but, but the thing I'm most proud of is ain't any of them in jail. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> have, have they ever appeared in jail, though? Like, you know, an overnight stint ever. Because if you got away with that one, you're doing good. Well, uh, I don't think any of them's been in jail as much as I have. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now, hopefully that was just for a role on TV, give or take. Um, uh, well, l- most of it, yeah. <laughs> Oh man, I just my yeah my child my children range from nine to are you ready for this? The oldest is turning eighteen in four days. Four days, eighteen. Yeah, is that a, is that a male or a female? It's child? a girl. She's a girl. She's turning eighteen. God help me. I bet you she's going to some uh, big uh, school, isn't she? Some uh, not yet. She's still in college. She's still in high school. So this is uh, her final year of high school. She's a senior. Where does, where does she want to go after that? You know, at this point, I think she just wants to become a hippie witch in the woods, to be perfectly honest. Well, there, there's something to be said for that. <laughs> I We've been trying. We've been pushing, you know, Let, let's 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 go for let, Let's reach for some goals here. So no, no, you know, don't, but, don't shove her. My, my folks tried to shove me and look where I ended up. I think you're doing all right. The shove worked out a well for you, Mr. Barry Corbin. Man, yeah. 57. What we didn't cover much about, you know, the, the kids um in the last episode that we did with you. Uh if you can recall, I love asking this question, but um, you're gonna have to reach back in the memory banks on this one, Barry. Um, can you remember? 58 years ago, give or take that day when you found out you were going to become a dad for the first time. And if you can, the emotions, can you recall that? Uh, well, there's that, that's a complicated deal because, uh, the 57 year old, I didn't know was, uh, I, I didn't know I had a child that age until she was 26. Okay. Interesting. Uh, you know, it's uh, uh, I, I'd uh, I'd talked to her mother. I was uh, uh, I was a student. I'd I'd been in the Marine Corps. I was a student at uh, Texas Tech, and I went to uh, do a summer uh, at uh, the University of Colorado, where they had a Shakespeare festival. Right, and. Uh, I would I would call her. I didn't have a phone. I lived out in the ranch house where I uh, well, I started out in the dorm, but I didn't like that, so I moved out to a ranch house. The woman had a ranch, and she needed some fixes, uh, fences fixed, and and so I went out there and lived in a little line shack at her house, me and one other actor. So we'd go out there and work from uh, morning, to, uh, you know, like eight in the morning till, uh, till noon in order to pay our rent. That's what the way we paid our rent. And, uh, then we'd go in for rehearsal. Well, uh, when we'd go in for rehearsal, I'd find the pay phone and call my, my girlfriend. She wasn't really my girlfriend, but we, we were close friends. Right. And we'd, uh, we'd had, uh, you know, we kind of slept over the line a little bit once in a while, but it was, <laughs> we were mainly just close friends. And uh, so she, uh, I, I called her one day and she said, well, uh, uh, she might be pregnant. And I said, oh, <laughs> well, uh, in that case, when I get home uh, uh, from the deal here, uh, we'll get married. Cause that's what you did back then, you know. Right. And uh, well, that scared the hell out of her. <laughs> so when I called her the next weekend uh, or the next time I got on the phone, she said, "Oh, well, it was false alarm, and uh, uh, I'm going to go to another school, so I won't be here when you come back. But you have a a, a good good life." Wow! And it turns out she that's- was pregnant, huh? Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. She gave the baby up for adoption. She thought it was better for me not to even worry about it, which, uh, you know, it was, it was kind of thoughtful of her in a way, but uh, another way it kind of was, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't, I, I, hell, I couldn't raise the baby anyway. Right. But uh, she was adopted by a doctor and his wife here in Arlington, Texas. Well, it went uh, went along. 
several years, and I was doing a show called Northern Exposure. We'd just done the first eight episodes. And I was back in California. My phone rings, and my agent, who's uh, it was a guy named John Barkworth. John Barkworth was a nervous fella. <laughs> uh, he uh, he was. Uh, he he called me on the phone and he said, uh, I, 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 I had a call from a woman uh, and, and she says that she uh, might be uh, your, your daughter. Well, I hadn't thought about that in a good while. You know, I had two boys by this time. Right. Or actually, I had three boys by this time, but one of them was uh, not living with me. Uh, uh, and uh, so I said, well, uh, uh, where was she uh, born? He said, San Antonio, Texas. I said, Texas. Well, that makes sense. When was she born? Right. And gave me a, uh, gave me a birth date. And I went, eh, 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 eh. that works out. Right. Uh, and then he told me, you know, gave me a couple other clues. All of it worked out. I said, you know, the most interesting thing about this phone call is probably true. <laughs> right. Uh, give give me her number. So I got her number and called her up on the phone. We talked for about an hour. By the time we hung up, we uh, we caught up with everything, and I and I, I guess she was my daughter. And uh, she didn't know uh, who her mother or her father were. You know, she she grown up in a nice uh, upper middle class home, right. but her son, when he was born, my. Uh, my grandson had uh, some health problems. He had scoliosis, and he had uh, he he turned out to be to have uh, uh, some other health problems, asthma and things. And uh, so she wanted to find out if this was uh, genetic. She was in she was working on her. Uh, Masters and her PhD in psychology at the time, and uh, so uh, she started calling around. She got hold of her mother first, and her mother said, "Well, I don't know if you want to tell your talk to your dad or not because he's uh, an actor and he's on the television show right now, and he doesn't know you exist." <laughs> Can you imagine that on her side? All right. Okay. And, and, uh, she said, uh, I, I, I'm not going to say no, but it's a television show called, uh, uh, Northern lights or something like that. Right. Northern exposure. And she said, you mean Northern exposure? She said, yes. Uh, and, uh, so she figured out. Out that uh, the only two that could be would be John Cullum and me. And since she had dark eyes and dark hair, and her mother had blue eyes and blonde hair, she figured out it must be me. Right. And so that's when she called, searched around, found my agent, called him. So after we talked, for an hour that first day, we talked about every day after that. And I had her and her husband fly out to, uh, to visit in, uh, in California. So we got, you know, I mean, we, re we got really, really closer and closer and got to be, you know, where we, we were uh, not only father and daughter, but best friends. That's amazing. And and the relationship is still close and good to this day. She lived across the street. <laughs> ah, <laughs> that's awesome. Wow. That's She's, an amazing uh, story. Yeah. She breeds a mastiff dog. She's got a beautiful, she's a master gardener. She's a great decorator. She's got, uh, 
I don't know how many uh, houses that she rents out for uh, Airbnb. You know? Right. Yeah. I, I don't know how that works, but she she's got all this stuff. Hmm. And uh, so uh, what happened was, I uh, she and her husband were having some trouble, and they they got divorced. And my wife uh, uh, didn't. Uh, I don't know. We we got a divorce too. I mean, it was uh, around the same time. So I came down here and looked around, found a place that was uh, close close enough so her. So her little boy could uh, uh, be close to the hospitals, you know, right. between Dallas and Fort Worth. And I bought Bobby Valentine's place, the uh, coach for the Texas Rangers at the time, because he was moving and I bought his place. So it was room for horses and cattle and all, you know, everything. So we kind of raised your kids. Her, her husband, her ex-husband was, he was around, but he not uh, uh, not a whole lot. But he was he was around some. But mainly they were. Uh, she was raising them. I was out working somewhere. Yeah. Uh, so Which it lead, uh, it worked out good. Leads me to another question: with the amount of, I mean, acting and roles that you have played in your lifetime. How, I mean, were you gone more often than you were present with the upbringing of your sons? Oh, bringing up my sons. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Was uh, that tough on you, man, up. being away from them like that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, it's a trade off, and it's, uh, that's why so many uh, people in my business don't, uh, don't have successful marriages or, uh, you know, successful, uh, right. uh, lives that are, that are like everybody else's. It's a trade off. You trade, uh, you know, either, either I could dig ditches or load launders trucks and, and, and feed them bologna sandwiches, or I could go out and really work and make money. And, uh, and, right. you know, they can have, have a good education and so forth. Yeah, that's that's one of the uh, the pickles that I mean, even me, I, I go through on a, on a almost daily basis. It's you know, I get I, I'm home every single night. Don't get me wrong, but during the summer and and then those vacation days and weekends, I'm out doing something or other almost every single day of the week. And when they're home and I'm not, that's just that's tough, man. But I, it's hard to explain to them. It's like, look. Papa's got to be well, out to make that bread so you guys can continue to live in this house and have the internet and the heat they, and all that good stuff. And when they hate start it. having kids, when they start having kids, they'll uh, they'll remember. Yeah. So, <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> yeah. It's a struggle. Well, my, it's a struggle right now. You know, it's like what Mark Twain said. He said, "When I was uh, when I was eighteen, my father didn't know anything." And then uh, when I was 20, he knew even less. Then I got to be 30, and it's amazing how much the old man learned in 10 years. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, <laughs> uh, that was Mark Twain doing the learning, though. That's, that's the moral yeah. of that story right there. <laughs> wow. So, I mean, gosh. So we raised the kids. You did the work, and you brought home the bread. You are, how are you still doing this? I mean, is it that much love for the game or, I mean, cause I mean, oh. you, 82 years old and you're starring in Tulsa King. Well, I did a show. Uh, I did a show the other night, Saturday night. I, I've been wanting to do this for a while. Okay. Where I, uh, went out and it opened by, we didn't plan to have this opening, but this, uh, this young girl, uh, uh, Joy uh, Lenz, Bethany Joy Lenz, who was in the uh, One Tree Hill, which I was in several years ago. Mm -hmm. She's a singer, and she was coming through town, so she said, can I open for you? I said, well, yeah, that'd be fine. Take some pressure off me. 
right? Because I'm re- I'm recovering from surgery still, and uh, so they uh, so I, you know I didn't know if I had the energy to get through a two hour or, or more show, you know. But what I I wanted to do was just to go out, not know what I'm going to do go out and talk to the audience like they were friends in, in my living room. Right. And my grandson, uh, Jordan, the one that who had the health problems and stuff. Now he's a successful actor and got a podcast called what's your lamp. What's and, your uh, lamp. Okay. Yeah. And they ought to catch that because it's, it's very inspirational people for anybody. Everybody's got a problem. Right. And uh, so he he talked to him about what the problem is, and uh, he's uh, he's he's doing very well with it. But he's also on the Chosen, and uh, he was on 1883 and a bunch of other stuff. So he's all he's he's busy, but he put together some film clips for me to to play, and he was sort of my uh, uh, interviewer. Kind of. I mean, he, he introduced me and then he sat and played the film clips. Right. I'd comment on them, talk about anything that came into my mind. So I came out and talked. Uh, she's uh, Joy sang for about, uh, she did about four songs. And then I came out and I spoke for about 45 minutes about anything that came, came up. Right. And, uh, you know, including the film clips because I hadn't seen those and uh, slides and various things. Yeah, that's him. And uh, you go. Uh, uh, we we did we did that. I told Jordan to keep keep a look on the time at eight thirty. Right. We break break for an intermission, so he he uh, he called me Manpaul. He said, because uh, he couldn't say grandpa when he was a baby. So he called me Mampa still. Mampa. Yeah. He okay. said, uh, he said, he said, Mampa, it's 830. I said, all right. Well, we're going to take a break here. Any of you that uh, want to, after we come back from intermission, can come up to these microphones we've got on either side of the stage and ask me questions. If I don't know the answer to it, I'll lie and pretend I do. <laughs> okay. And take uh, it till you make if, it. I get it. And if you don't, uh, if you if you under indictment somewhere, or you're running from the sheriff or a, a spouse who's looking for you, you can write down your question, put it in the fishbowl out there, and we'll read it. <laughs> okay. So y'all have a good time. I'm going to go back here and take some water and uh, get a little rest and I'll be back here in 15 minutes. So y'all just come on back in. Be sure and spend some money out there because this is a benefit for the theater. Yeah. So they went out and then they came back in. They asked questions. I answered questions till about uh, less. So we got started back about a quarter to nine. I answered questions till about 10. What's the most common question you get, give or take? Uh, mostly uh, 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 one line from uh, from War Games. People want to know where that came from. Okay. Uh, it was an ad lib line. It wasn't in the script, and uh, it was. Uh, when uh, Matthew Broderick comes in to take over the computer in the in the NORAD headquarters and shoves the guy at the computer over and says and starts to type stuff on there. And the guy he shoved over was a, a Air Force major and he was the technical advisor for the movie. He said, well, wait a minute, I wouldn't let this kid just come in here and shove me away unless I had a direct order from the general. And so John Batham, who directed the movie, said, uh, can you think of anything to give the kid a direct order to get in there? I said, yeah, I believe I can. 
He said, do you want to tell me what it is? I said, no, let's just shoot it. Right. So he uh, said, okay, action. And the guy, and he starts to shove the guy, the, the major over, and the major looks at me, and I say, God damn it, I'd piss on the spark plug if I thought it'd do any good. Let that boy in there, major. <laughs> and I thought it was just a joke. You know, I right. didn't think they'd use it. I thought we'd think of something else, but right. I thought that was kind of a funny thing. Everybody laughed. And he said, well, we've got to do that again because everybody laughed. Everybody keep your, be serious now. So we did it again. And I said, you're not going to use that, are you? He said, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's so funny, man. The and they used it. I, uh, I literally, no joke, in the 15 minutes prior to you jumping onto this interview today, I was on YouTube just, you know, looking up Barry Corbin stuff, you know, getting acclimated, getting in the groove for today's show. And that scene popped up. And it's, I mean, I was a kid, man. I was nine years old when that movie came out. One of my favorites, I had to watch that scene. So it's, it's fresh as fresh can be in my mind. You telling that story because I just watched that scene on YouTube. That that's amazing, Nick. Well, I knew I knew we had a hit because I went to a little league ball game and I and one kid they were having having a tough time. One kid said used that line, said that line to another kid. And I yeah, said, right, we got a hit here. We got there. It hit. is. Oh, that's awesome. Nick, I, I'm going to give you the conch, man. I know you, you've been kind of quiet today, so I know yeah. you got stuff from Mr. Corbin. Let's go. I do. So I just started watching Tulsa King. Can you give us any hints? Are you coming back on other than the the quick little glimpse we got of you in the bar? Oh, yeah. I'll be back. I'll be okay. back. Uh, I, I don't do a whole lot because I'm uh, I'm I'm afflicted. I've, I've got uh, either some kind of dementia or Alzheimer's. I'm not sure what, but I'm, I'm, I'm not a clear thinker. Right. Okay. But I, when it comes right down to it, I'm, uh, I'm much clearer thinking than, uh, anybody else. So right. I, I can give you that kind of <laughs> little hand. We'll, we'll just leave it at that. And for yeah. those, and, and by the way, we are not sponsored by Paramount Plus, but we'd love to be. Um, check that out. Tulsa King, <laughs> Paramount Network, Paramount Plus, wherever you get your stuff and streaming. It's a great show. Um, yeah, that's amazing. Um, <clears throat> wow. So, yeah. So, actually, I watched part of the clips of that thing you were talking about with Joy. It, it, amazing. Like, you've got to go find the whole interview or whatever, the sit down that you did. That is, well, that is, we taped we taped the whole thing because yeah. I'm thinking I'm thinking about taking it out on the road just for fun, you know. Because oh, I it's like great. to talk to people, and it's it's a fun way to do it. Yeah, um, want to make I'm, your? I'm, can you make your way up to Southern Oregon? Say I don't know, springtime, early summer. If your schedule open, well, we could find a place for it. you and probably pay I, you I pretty well. We can make it happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, that one thing I don't want to do, I don't want to, I don't want to fool with the TSA anymore. So now I drive wherever I go. So we got to get a couple of places up in that area where I can do it. Yeah. So I can come up there for a week or so, and then right. and uh, maybe I, I do, can help you with that. Do a little little mini tour. Yeah, we bring Tyler Hill now to open. You know, a little another One Tree Hill guy. Right. Well, maybe somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This is this this is again a conversation that we will have off 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 the air. But I was oh, just plan I was just all planting was, a seed, yeah, Nick. But I'm in. No, we we, we we got we got to drop the germ here, so people watching this will <laughs> say, "Oh, well, maybe he'll do that." Maybe, okay. Maybe all right. We'll, so, maybe we'll come pay money to do, see it. I think we need to get That's some whiskey. Thing. Sit around some, what? With Barry, some whiskey and sit around Barry and drink some whiskey and just listen to stories. I think that's a well. That's what that's, that's what, what we did doing. afterwards. When I sat there, <laughs> I, I sat there till midnight signing autographs and, and taking oh, pictures with people. How do you, and, how do you do uh, that? I'm like how do I'm I do 23 it? and I have to be in bed by nine o'clock. <laughs> so. Oh hell, I, I I'm up till three every morning. Wow, Nick Nick can't. He's not much of a drinker anymore. So that's yeah. that's the problem. I know the problem is I'll have two sips of whiskey and I'll be just totally hammered and yeah, no, <laughs> I don't. Uh, it, it makes me energetic. All right, mm. 
It, me and, too. And, that's, and, that's, <laughs> and that, that's kind of a curse because, uh, uh, you know, if it makes you more energetic, then you get dangerous. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm Irish, man. You don't got to tell me two times. That's why I stopped yeah. drinking as much well, as I used to. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm Irish and Cherokee, and somebody told me they ain't a gene worth saving. <laughs> <laughs> I right, say well, boo to those people. I don't know who the hell well, they I, are, I, but I, I passed it on. I passed it on to to my kids, and uh, all of them pretty much teetotalers. Yeah, they don't uh, they don't drink. Uh, well, my oldest boy drinks a little bit, but the rest of my, my youngest is in AA and my middle son never did, uh, never did have a taste for it. My oldest son, of course, he was in Afghanistan and, uh, all that. So he got uh, a taste for a whole bunch of stuff. He lives on the boat off Key West now. Oh, I love that neck of the woods. I, uh, I traveled, yeah. to, I traveled to South Florida. I try to, um, at least once a year with the lady. Um, I have yet to bring my kids with me. Although every single time I go, they beg me, dad, can we please go with you this time? And every year I'm like, yes, next year you can go. And then that year comes around and mama, the wife, the lady says, uh, we're going by ourselves. <laughs> and then, you know, I thought about that. I thought about moving to Florida because my in-laws, my my, my, uh, my wife's parents, uh, they were older when she was born. So uh, I'm uh, I'm eight years younger than her mother, <laughs> and uh, and so they were older when we married. And uh, the, 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 my wife bought a house and. Her parents lived on the bottom floor. They couldn't climb the stairs. And so we were going to move in the top floor of the house. But I couldn't stand the smell of the damn place. It smells like fish. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, you got to, I wouldn't even call it an and island, also, you know? It's just so. I don't like tiny. alligators. No, nope, yep. Like alligators. They're everywhere. And what about lizards falling from the trees? What? No, I don't care for that no. either. <laughs> yeah, there, dude. You we're talking iguanas and whatnot. Just no, fall from the trees, knock your ass out when you're walking, mind your own business down the street. So I did. that's I like to visit Florida. That's what from I'm saying. On, lead with that stuff when you tell me all these great places to go to. <laughs> don't say all oh, the fish tacos are amazing. So I get all excited. They I'm are amazing. A taco and a lizard's gonna fall on me, and I'm gonna just I'm gonna cry. It's <laughs> not gonna be good. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. See, any place you want to go, then. In the whole state of Texas, everything has either got thorns or it'll, it's poisonous or it'll just eat you. Right. You know, <laughs> there's not anything that's, that's, uh, that, that's friendly here. It's all, uh, it's all vicious. Somebody said, uh, if, uh, if I was a devil, I'd live in hell and run out of Texas. Yep. I was in my dive with, I was talking about of looking at Barry Corbin clips. I also came across the most recent one from, well, the one scene you had in Yellowstone um, where uh, you're talking to the, the wannabe cowboy kid and he was, oh, sleeping, yeah. he was sleeping on the ground and you said, next time get on a bench or something. Otherwise next time you're going to be uh, wrapped up next to a rattler. And yeah, yeah there you go. Texas. Yeah, I spent some time yeah, in Texas. Yeah, yeah. My sister was just, in the Air Force in Lubbock, and she did. She's a she's an alum of Texas Tech. She's a Red yeah. Raider, so uh, I spent some time out there. I, I love Texas, man. I, I I'm not scared of it. It's I got to get out there. My son is in the Army out there in Texas. I, I can't remember which base he's on, but he's he's been there for about a year and a half now. He's probably down around Killeen, down in there. Yes, yes, That's, uh, yeah. Yeah, I imagine I I forget the name of that place, but yeah, I uh, I was I grew up in Lubbock, and uh, it's a uh, it's not a friendly environment. <laughs> the only people the only people that really liked it was the Comanches. Right. That's that's a while ago though. Yeah, <laughs> I mean anybody else. Anybody else lives there now. Just has a love hate relationship with it. I just got a book called "The One Hundred Years of Texas Tech," 
Uh huh. And I realized, and I'm in the book. I'm, I'm, I've got a big spread in the book. And I realized that Texas Tech is 18 years older than I am. Oh, wow. That's a so great I'm decent a, stat. <laughs> yeah, I thought so. That's, I mean, God, so uh, quick math. That's 100 years old. Yeah. Give or yeah. take. The title, 100 Years <laughs> of Texas Tech. 100 Years of Texas Tech, the Red Raiders. 100, 100 Years of Texas Tech, and I only messed 18 up. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. You still got the rest of them. You got 82 of them right there. So what's so, uh, on tap? Is there any uh, any uh, filming in the very near future for you while you're on uh, are you, are you still recovering or what's going on in the world of Barry Corbin these days in the very next? Oh future? yeah. I'm, uh, I've got a bunch of, of uh, uh, quite, uh, you know, they, they, what they do, they put out an availability check, right? So they want you to let them know if you're doing anything. Well, uh, I, I don't have anything definite right now, but, uh, I'm about to put together some, uh, a few of these, uh, doing this show, right? Which is not going to be the same show at all. Every time, it's going to be completely different. But uh, uh, I'm thinking about doing that, and then I've got a uh, couple of movies that uh, I'm probably going to do, and some TV. And uh, I'm 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 not uh, retirement ain't in the, in the cards. I mean, that it was possible when I got diagnosed with this deal. I was diagnosed with oral cancer. Okay. And they had to, they had to cut me right, right here so they could get some, uh, some samples of the lymph nodes. Right. But the cancer was up in here. And they, they told me I would have to be in the hospital for uh, a week to 10 days after the surgery. Well, I woke up from the anesthetic. They had me under anesthesia for eight hours. I woke up from the anesthetic. And 12 hours later, I was getting dressed and going home. <laughs> <laughs> I, I said, I'm not staying in this place. Did they fight you on so, that? No, well, yeah, the doctor said, well, you, uh, you've got to have some tests first. I said, well, give me the test. Exactly. To come, come to my so place. We could test me there. They, they, they sent a, uh, a, a physical therapist in a little woman. She had a walker, you know, one of these aluminum things that folds up. Yeah. She said, can you walk? I said, well, I could yesterday. And she said, well, what about now? I said, well, I don't know. Let's see. She said, well, can you get on this walker and just walk across the room? I said, I'll tell you what, just follow me. And I got out of bed and I took off down the hall, walked right. around the nurse's stand, walked walk back around. By the time I got back to the room, she was chasing me. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, I was winded, but I got back in bed and I said, is that all right? Did I pass? And she said, well, uh, yes. And so, so they, uh, then they sent somebody in to talk to me if I was psychologically prepared to go out into the world again. <laughs> and then they wanted to know if I, if I'd been oh. abused at home by anybody, I said, well, if anybody's being abused, it's somebody else and I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they let you go home whenever they, how's the prognosis yeah, now? Yeah. Is that, are, are, are we good? Are you in the clear is good? Good. So far, you know, you're, if you have this kind of, well, any kind of cancer, if you get it, you're a patient for life, they say. Right. So I've got to go in about every three months, and they look at me and say, but uh, there's, there was no spread. I mean, it's, uh, it was all contained, and uh, they got it all. Uh, it was kind of iffy. They thought they might have to take a piece of bone out of my leg, put in my jaw to, uh, but yeah. they didn't, they didn't have to do that. 
Yeah, I'm very didn't have to have any didn't have to have any uh, radiation or chemo or anything like that. Good, good. So it's good. I would call yourself very lucky. My uh my lady, I don't know if I talked about it when you were on the show last, but she had a double mastectomy and a bout about of breast cancer. So, but she beat yeah. it. Um she's good. Um and you know, to this day everything seems good so far and yeah. she has yet to we're talking almost 2 years now she has yet to go in for uh reconstructive surgery if you catch my yeah. drift and uh i at this point i thought she was just never you know it wasn't going to happen she, you know she was finally comfortable in her body and obviously you know don't get me wrong i i wouldn't mind the reconstruct surgery you know being a guy and yeah. all it, it 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 wouldn't be a terrible thing in the world of me but if she chose not to that's fine um, she said something under her breath the other day that I think she's going to go in next beginning of next year and start the process and I, under my breath and I, inside, I was just like, yes, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, well, yeah, it's I'll scary, you, man. After, after going through this one, if they want to do another surgery on me, they got to make me just damn sure that I'll die if I don't have it. Right. Otherwise they're going to have to catch me when they start sharpening up those knives. I'm not, I don't want to, I don't want to recover from the anesthesia. That's the main thing, you know, getting, uh, getting your energy back after you've been anesthetized for all that time. Yeah. This was it. Was that a process for you? Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I went back to work on, uh, Tulsa King and I had one scene and I was in an easy chair and they, uh, Shot the first shot, first uh, take, and then uh, they were going to move the camera and the lights. And they called my stand-in to sit down in the easy chair for me and let me go have a cup of coffee or something. I said, I'll tell you what, you can just let let him stay out there in the yard. And uh, when it comes time to, when you get older, all everything set, lights and the camera and everything. Just poke me and say action. <laughs> He's so easy to work so with. Went, all right. I went to sleep and I slept there, you know, maybe 15 minutes. And uh, they woke me up and I said, I went through the scene again and maybe a couple, three times. And then they going to change again. And I said, okay, here we go. <laughs> yeah. so i napped the whole time oh man what a life uh were any of these scenes with sylvester uh yeah uh, I, I, Marjorie, actually, like, yeah I, i'm getting probably asking questions i shouldn't and you can't answer yet because it hasn't aired i'm sorry yeah 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 i i uh, i was with him uh some but we we had very little uh communication between us because my character didn't communicate with anybody right. much. But what about like, you know, off, off camera, off air, uh, was there any oh, uh, we, hanging we, out with Sylvester? Say hello. I, I think he was having some personal problems or something right around that time. So we didn't have, we didn't sit and have conversations, but he was, uh, I think it was all in the tabloid and stuff about his he and his wife are going to break up. Now they're back together again. I don't know what something, but, I, but he wasn't. Uh, <laughs> Whatever's going on. He, 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 his character he seemed to be weird. preoccupied. Yeah, gotcha, and gotcha. He wasn't in, the, in, the, in my business, and I didn't want to know any more than that. <laughs> <laughs> Man, well, that's a great show. I mean, yeah, it's you've got this string of just, I mean, almost every show in the past, five years that you have appeared on I've been just knocking out of the park. I mean, better call Saul uh, the ranch, dude. the oh, ranch, yeah. Yellowstone, yeah. Tulsa King. Well, there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot of them between there that you, uh, that you didn't see. Well, but, that, yeah. that, let's see, let, let, let's, let's see here. I've still got it up here. Yeah, well, Jeepers, nine, nine 11 Lone Star, young yeah. Sheldon, yeah. blood and oil, parenthood, Dallas. I mean, those are what they got listed here. I mean, those, yeah. every single one of those well, shows well, is an absolute hit. There's about a dozen movies that are going, probably going to go straight to Walmart. 
<laughs> Are we talking Killers of the Flower Moon? No, no, that's going to be a big. That's going to be a big one. That's a big budget picture. Okay, because that's in post production uh, right that, now. That's uh, 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 Martin uh, Scorsese. Yeah. And, Ooh. Uh, got uh, got got uh, Leo DiCaprio and uh, and Robert De Niro in it. It's, it's going to be a good one. Man, I mean, if yeah, I, I could really just know. Nick, if we could just get Barry Corbin's Rolodex. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We just need to I get, don't, I don't get anybody's phone number. I don't <laughs> want anybody's phone number. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's probably a good thing because then you got a holes like me who come on the show and that's be like, why, "Hey Barry, hey, you maybe give me Sylvester Stallone's here. number." <laughs> I live, I live out here in, in, in Texas. The only people I deal with are plumbers and cowboys and people <laughs> like that. So I don't. <laughs> I don't deal with all those folks in California. Do you still go? Uh, are you still able to go riding? I, uh, I last time I was on the horse was about uh, six months ago. I put him on the flag and did a little, did a little back and forth. But yeah. uh, no, not much. Not okay. much. Is that? Do you miss that? Or is I mean, are you? you can you maybe get back on well, that horse one day? Or is is that a sore subject? Here. <laughs> when you're all, when you're over eighty, uh, you figure if you have an accident, it's going to be pretty serious. Yeah, there is that. Uh, and I'm uh, I'm I'm eighty two, so I'm all my uh, all my bronc riding's behind me. Yeah, I'll get I'll get on the horse if he's uh, if he's well broke and if he's. Uh, if he'll stand there long enough for me to get on him, because I'm not going to be able to vault on him. Right. You know, so it's, uh, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't anticipate that I'll do a whole lot of riding anymore. Okay. That sucks. All right, Nick, man, I did it again. I'm sorry. I just keep talking. <laughs> I keep asking uh, questions. Well, it's, you know it's what, it's, it's actually, it, it doesn't bother me because I've already, I've already done all that. You know, they can't say, well, he's just a blowhard, you know. Oh yeah, I've yeah. I've already done that. Yeah, you've yes, you have. You yeah, there's no one's yeah. arguing the fact that you are not a cowboy, yeah. good sir. Woo wee! <laughs> that is mm, good stuff. And you played one in Yellowstone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like was that character like the truest character that is Barry Corbin? Like, if you were to play yourself in a role, would that be it? What was that? You played that on me. If you were to play yourself uh, in any role, is the role you did in Yellowstone the closest to who you are in real life? Uh, probably the role I played in the ranch would be more like me. Okay. Interesting. Uh, that'd probably be. Uh, I, you know, I was never. For a real cowboy, I, I mean, I'd go out and help them gather cattle and brand and all that stuff. But I, I was never, I never made my living as a cowboy. Right. And uh, you know, that's a different breed of people. Uh, the guy I was talking to in the end of that episode, Buster Welch, he was the epitome of the cowboy. Yeah. I mean, and I, I knew him well. We were friends, and uh, and I knew uh, there was a guy named Tom Blassingame who worked uh, for the J.A. Ranch most of his life. Started out as a cowboy when he was about 17 and uh, worked until he was, uh, he was 97. And I met him the, in, uh, in the fall of 97. Or, or when he when he was ninety seven, mm -hmm. and uh, I we met at the Cowboy Symposium there in Lubbock. And I talked to him for about an hour. We talked about what his uh, what his life was. And he was married and he had kids, but he didn't live with them. They lived up in Clarendon in town. He lived in the line shack most of the time by himself on the ranch and he was in charge of that area of the ranch. And, uh, when he turned 70, they didn't buy him a coat to break. 
they always bought the cowboy's coat to break each year. Uh huh. And they didn't buy him once and made him mad. So he went out and bought one himself, <laughs> brought it back and broke it. Well, he was, he was still riding young horses, kind of rank horses when he was in his nineties. And, uh, right after, uh, you know, when we parted company, I said, uh, I said, well, uh, Mr. Blaston gave him, I guess, I hope I see you next, uh, next year. And he said, well, you will, if the boss lets me sit around, stick around. Right. And, uh, between Christmas and new years, he was out riding a two year old colt by himself. And he was checking fences. And something happened out there and he got off that coat and tied the reins to the saddle horn and walked away from me, walked away and laid down and took his hat off, put it on his chest and died. Wow. He knew. And that, uh, that horse went back to the line shack first, but there wasn't anybody there. So he finally ended up. Uh, about a day or so later going, showing up at the headquarters and they went out and found him out there, found old Tom. And he, you know, that's, to me, you got to go sometime and you got to go some way, but that's the best time and the best way that I can think of. Yeah, that, that is doing what he loved, knowing it. And, uh, yeah. And being able to, yep. you know, call your shot, I guess, you know, if, if that's what you want to call it. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. Most of, us, most of us aren't able to do that. No, no, not, not so much. And most of us don't get the, like, you know, when, since this is dad cast, we, we, you know, we usually talk about our children, but I, I rarely talk about my father, um, who is an amazing man. And we're just, you know, obviously on the topic of, of death and passing and, 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 and going on, I never had the opportunity to say goodbye. And that's one of my regrets that I, you know, I have no control over. It's nothing I, I, I can do about that, but you mentioned yeah. that's the best way. And I, you know, that's, you know, at least we had a great relationship, saw him all the time, you know, but you know, if I just had that one, I know so many people who had those last moments, you know, whether they're sick for a long time and they know it's coming. I don't know what's worse that and spending time with the loved one or boom, it just happens. It's instant, but you didn't get to say goodbye. Dad didn't get to say goodbye to his son. It just happened. I don't know what's worse, but yeah, man, didn't need to get all well, down and down and depressing. Hold on. Hold on. I'll give you some insight. We do have something in common there. My dad passed away in 2019 mm -hmm. and he was sick for months. And it was the hardest thing going to the hospital to watch him and be there with him. Like I, yeah. I it's terrible. But to see now on the flip side, it could have happened faster. I'll keep it on the flip side. If you had the choice between what you experienced and boom, you get a phone call eight hours away. Your father died. He had a massive heart attack. You didn't get to say goodbye. You didn't get to, which would you choose? If you had to choose one of those two would, options, I would choose the phone call. Really? Yeah, it was. See, so I, I choose the other I, man. Yeah. And I think it was hard too. Cause I didn't talk to my dad for 18 years. So like we had just rebuilt our relationship like three years prior to him getting sick. Mm -hmm. So it was like, we were just becoming good friends again. And like, he was, you know, just met my Danielle and he knew the baby was on the way. And, you know, we were trying to do all that kind of stuff and yeah, he never got to meet Liam. So it was, I think, it was, I think all that playing into it, it would have been easier just to get a phone call. Hey, your dad died. Sorry. My father passed. Either way, I don't. A wish month after he found out he was going to be a grandfather to his first grandson, which is oh, my son Sawyer. Yeah. Never got to meet him. Um, what about your father, Barry? Were you guys close? Uh, sort of, in a way. He he never did understand uh, until he saw me in in a movie. Right. Television didn't count to him. He hadn't seen me in a movie. <laughs> and. Uh, I mean, television was okay, but, uh, it's like, uh, Lee Horsley's, uh, grandmother, when he was on that, uh, uh, Houston show, the one that they played, the uh, the 
private detective on. Okay. His mother, his grandmother lived in Muleshoe, Texas. And, uh, she, he went to visit her and she said, well, that's fine, Lee, but what do you do, uh, uh, the rest of the week? You know, she thought they just went out and shot that thing in, yeah. in regular time. Took them an hour to do it. And then the rest of the week, he just had, yeah. didn't do anything. Well, my dad thought they kind of like that, you know. He was he was not, uh, but he thought a movie was another deal. You know, they put a lot of money in those things. Right. But he, uh, he, he uh, was... I, I was down here with it, my sister's house for Christmas and, and uh, New Year's, and he was here with us. And uh, a photographer wanted to take a picture of, of my family, and so we went out. and I, I didn't think he'd go, he because he usually wouldn't do anything like that. But he went out, and we took had pictures taken. I had a picture of me and. Uh, my mother and my dad. And, uh, he sat there for a little while and then he, he said, well, I, I need to go back to the house. So he, my son-in-law took me, I mean, my brother-in-law took him back to the house. And, uh, then we went back, we had dinner and I flew out of town the next day. I think, I think they, they flew back to Lubbock the next day. And uh, I was back at work on Northern Exposure up in Washington. I got a call uh, from my mother about a week after New Year's. So I just walked into the into the kitchen, and and your dad was sitting in his chair. And he's dead, and uh, he'd gotten up. He, uh, he looked at me before he, before he left, before I left. Right. I could, I could tell this might be the last time. Yeah. It's the end of the but, uh, he, he, uh, he, he took, took mother home. Mother was, uh, you know, she was almost blind. She couldn't, she had, uh, that, uh, uh some kind of deal where your eye, your sight age from the center of your eye. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so he took her to the laundromat to the grocery store and, uh, you know, they had a little visit and they slept in separate rooms because he would snore and kick around. So mother yeah, slept yeah. In, in the room, in, in my room. And, uh, so the, uh, he did all that. And then he got up the next one that, that morning after he'd already taken care of everything, laid out a suit and a shirt and a tie and a pair of, uh, handmade boots that he, that he liked, but hadn't worn in about 20 years and put them all by the bed, put the suit and the shirt and the, right, and the boots by the bed and the hat on the bed post. And, uh, then he went in and made himself a cup of coffee. I always drank a Coke before he had his coffee, he drank a Coke, smoked a camel cigarette, drank his coffee, put the cigarette out and died. Wow. And that, how that old was, was he? It. I, he was only 73, okay. I guess. Well, the but reason he, I ask, better, and, and I don't, I don't it, share, I don't share this too terribly often, uh, especially when we're doing the podcast, but I, I'm just taking notes for my own record. Okay. Yeah. So I got a bad habit. I got to stop that, but Hey, yeah. 73 years old, still smoking. All right, I'm doing okay, I guess. Right, right. We're doing okay. Well, he, what, what he'd done, he, he, he got into politics when he was a young man, uh -huh. and uh, quit smoking in 1943. I was three years old. Okay, I didn't remember him ever smoking. 
Then I went away in in uh, sixty five, I guess, and uh, I came back in uh, sixty eight, and uh, he was sitting there in his chair smoking a camel cigarette. And I said, "What are you doing?" And he lit one off the other. He just smoked it. I, I never saw him without a cigarette unless he's asleep. Wow. Yeah, I'm not that bad. After that. And uh, I said, what are you doing? He said, well, when I quit smoking in 1943, I quit because I thought it didn't look good for a politician to be smoking. And then I, when I saw you kids growing up, I didn't want to influence you to smoke. So by the time, even when I got out of politics, I, I still didn't smoke. For a while, he said, now all you kids are grown and all of you are smoking. And uh, <laughs> I decided to hell with it. I've, uh, I've, I haven't had one day in those 25 years that I didn't want a cigarette. Now I'm going to do what I want to. <laughs> That's a great story. Yes. My, my grandfather, Kenneth Ranville Pierce, born in 1905, smoked filterless cigarettes and a tobacco pipe from the day he turned 16 years old till the day he died in 1983. You can do the math on that, Nick. Hey, I mean, we're talking, my earliest memories are going to grandpa and grandma's house and him just puffing on that pipe yeah. and then putting it away and smoking them cigarettes in the house where the kids were playing because oh, it was yeah. a different time. Oh, and yeah. uh, growing up, my parents would smoke in the car while we're driving. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, this is yeah, terrible. Yeah. That's, that was normal, though. Yeah. We didn't think yeah. anything of it. Yeah. And yeah. guess what? We're not I'm dead. Gonna, I'm just saying. Yeah, I would play, play in the play around. I remember when I, uh, maybe four or five, I'd be playing around on the floor, and there's blue haze of smoke all over everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, man. Barry Corbin, we are getting close. In fact, we are actually over uh, our time here on DadCast. I have just a couple more questions. Nick might have a couple more questions for you. And um, when I end this, please stay on with us just for a moment longer. Um, I have something I'd like for you to do, hopefully, after. We'll talk about that when that time comes. Um, okay. With that being said, um, an important question I like to like to ask all of our guests Um is this, if you could impart any wisdom, any advice to a new father or an expected father or hell, an experienced father out there from the mind of Barry Corbin, what advice would that be? Don't expect anything, but be proud of everything. That sounds like a tattoo. I, I see your next tattoo, actually. <laughs> I just don't expect anything but be proud of everything. Was that how that went? Yes, sir. All right. That is, that that is be our a next fantastic t-shirt. answer. Can we, that we should be. A, we need to get a picture of Barry's face, though, to put it next to it. So, Can we use your likeness on a T-shirt in our dad cast merch store? <laughs> well, you bet you. If you give me a nickel for everyone you sell. <laughs> you <Done. do. laughs> A nickel? <laughs> How about like 5%? It's a well more than, uh, screw that, 20%. All right. You're Barry Corbin. Come on. Okay, yeah, well, that'd be good. <laughs> All right, Nick, we got to get that done. I, Nick, do you, have, right <laughs> do you have any final questions for Mr. Barry Corbin? I do. So there's been a lot of One Tree Hill reunion stuff happening. Is there any talks of like an actual real One Tree Hill getting you all back together for maybe like a one episode, one off, or uh there he goes. He's fishing. He's fishing, Barry. I know I'm fishing. Oh, I don't think so. I, 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 th you know, all them kids. I mean, hell, they're middle-aged people now. I know. And uh, I'm, uh, uh, I, oh, why did why did Durham probably died fifteen years ago? <laughs> <laughs> He's coaching up uh, in heaven now, right? <laughs> yeah, probably. No, I don't. I don't think there's any any thought of that. Uh, I think if, if they do it, they'd probably cast, use a whole new cast, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, see, I would reboot. Yeah. The reboot. Yeah. Well, they do do a reboot. They know they got to cast you for, like, something. 
I mean, something. obviously the cameo. You need a man in that show. Right. All uh, right. Well, that may all right. <laughs> Ladies <laughs> and gentlemen, he is the star of every TV show and movie that has ever existed in the history of TV, Mr. Barry Corbin. Thank you so much for uh, well, thank taking you. time. It's been it's been a great time. We've had uh, this is wonderful. Oh, I love it, man. I wish we had more time. In fact, <clears throat> I'll plant a seed. seed. We're going to do another episode with you in the future. And I'll go with, with him and his grandson. Yeah, the germinated seed. Oh, yeah, that's what. <clears throat> wink, wink, <laughs> that's I was going to talk to him about that off the air, Nick. <laughs> okay? Just pump your brakes, man. Pump them. You've been like, you've yeah. been pushing the gas every episode, the last few episodes. I figure I'm going to jump back on that. I gas. know I have been pushing <laughs> the gas. I, I, I do that. I, 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 I took it from you. Uh, to know. everyone watching, wherever you may be, however you may be listening or watching worldwide, thank you so much for your support. This has been DadCast with legend Barry Corbin. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, like it, subscribe it, comment, do all the things that your social media requires, and we'll catch you on the very next episode. Have a great rest of your day. See you.